Welcome to the third and final installment in our 2020 Responsible AI series. My name is Jessica Windham. I direct the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program at AAAS. We serve as host for this series, which is sponsored by Hitachi. Today is International Human Rights Day, the day in 1948 when the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's only fitting that today's discussion is focused on the relationship between human rights and artificial intelligence. A review of Science Magazine articles reveals the complex relationship between the two. On the one hand, we hear a lot about the risks and realities of negative human rights impacts of AI. At the same time, AI offers opportunities for tackling tough human rights research and documentation challenges. I'm joined by two experts in the field who will explore those topics but also the question of how we could potentially integrate a human rights-based approach into the deployment and development of AI. Our first guest is Dr. Megan Price. She serves as Executive Director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Megan holds a PhD in biostatistics and has applied her statistical experience to multiple human rights investigations around the world. We're also joined by Enrique Pirases, Director of the Technology Program at the Center for Human Rights Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he explores both the opportunities and risks associated with new technological developments. Welcome to both of you. The format of the discussion will be an interview with and, and conversation among our guests with time for questions from you, our audience. So I invite you to post your questions throughout the discussion using the chat function at the right hand bottom corner of your screen. Please include your name and if you would like, let us know where you're connecting from. So to get us started, I want to begin with you, Megan. There are several ways in which you and HR DAG are using AI as a tool in human rights investigations. Could you briefly describe for our audience two or three examples? Thank you, yes. Um, one of the first examples is a project that my colleagues are working on with our partners at Data Civica and Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico. And that's work building um, AI or machine learning models to predict geographic locations that are likely to contain what are called fosas clandestinas or hidden graves. And this is a problem throughout Mexico where previously undiscovered graves are, are found uh, and these can be the result of any number of sources of, of violence. And the question our partners posed was, could we develop a model that could identify geographic locations and classify them as having a high probability or low probability of containing one of these undiscovered graves. And so we've been working with our partners to develop that classification model. And one of the things that's been most interesting about that work has been that in this particular case, the results of those models haven't been particularly surprising. Folks who, who do the work on the ground have said, well, of course, those are the those are the geographic regions with the highest probabilities because those are the areas where we know violence is occurring. But the modeling results have still proven really useful because they provide a new tool to those advocacy groups who are requesting investigations to look for those graves, which can be quite difficult and quite dangerous to make that request right now. So having that sort of distance of a scientific model said we should go look here um, has proven really useful. And that's been a really interesting application for us. And then another uh, use of these same kind of models, but in a really different setting, has been in what we call form extraction, or in trying to pull information out of unfriendly data formats. So PDFs, Word documents, images, um, sometimes that's just a coincidence. That's just the way the data was, in, was collected. But other times we think of it as being actually adversarial. An organization has been forced to share data um, through a lawsuit or through a FOIA request, and they're meeting the letter but not the spirit of that request by sharing it in some way that's difficult to access. And it turns out that's also a classification model to classify what kind of document it is, where in the document the information is contained, um, and then extract it into a way that can be analyzed. Great, thank you. And I, I appreciate the insight that sometimes what we're able to do with a new tool is to reveal information that perhaps, as you said, was not so surprising 
uh, and perhaps could have been discovered in other ways, but and yet there was still value um, in, in applying that tool. So thank you. Enrique, in your work, you've seen AI used to bring together multiple sources of data to inform human rights litigation in particular. What does that look like in practice? Hi, thank you. Um, most of the work that we have been involved from the Center for Human Rights Science is around uh, large collections of data. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is a, a larger interest or a growing interest in making sense out of uh, particularly large collections of videos coming from a, a national conflicts. And what we have seen is, uh, in, in, in practice, is a big challenge around what to do with these collections, how to handle that in terms of the kind of uh, infrastructure that organizations may have to deal with that, as well as uh, perhaps uh, uh, expectations that may be difficult to satisfy. I think that one of the things that we have seen is that there is uh, perhaps uh, some lack of literacy around what is uh, possible today uh, with machine learning and computer vision. Um, we have also been aware, and like perhaps some people in the audience, about some exercise that have been trying uh, to create some predictive models uh, around uh, sentencing or decision making uh, by courts. Uh, perhaps uh, some examples around uh, forecasting uh, the outcome of decisions at the European uh, Court for Human Rights is a good example. Uh, and we have seen an increasing interest in trying to model or predict how uh, the outcome of uh, some of these uh, trials. Thank you, Enrique. So, so Megan, AI clearly offers some opportunities um, to address human rights questions in ways that previous tools and methods could not. From a human rights perspective, though, how do you assess the risks and the opportunities inherent in the tools? And, and what does that mean for the way that you do your work at HR DAG? That's, that's a great question. So on our team, we try to think of every new opportunity or every new project in the framework of what's the cost of making a mistake and who's going to bear that cost. And we all know that models are imperfect. And in fact, that's a feature, not a bug of these kinds of models. If we were making perfect predictions, we would we would have overfit our model. We wouldn't actually be be gaining the insight that we get from these tools. And so as scientists, that idea of imperfection, we're very comfortable with it. But when we think about the context where we're implementing these models, it's crucial that we ask, well, when that model makes a mistake, whether we think of it as a false positive or a false negative, what is the cost of that mistake and who bears it? And so in the example I mentioned earlier in Mexico, the way we've been thinking about that work is when the model makes uh, a mistake, when it makes perhaps a, a false positive, then what we do is we suggest allocating resources somewhere that they probably weren't needed. So we've perhaps um, inefficiently used our resources. Um, and when we get a false negative, then we miss an opportunity to conduct an investigation that maybe we should have. For the moment in our work in Mexico, we consider those mistakes to be still an improvement on the status quo, uh, or rather what we are able to gain out of the model in exchange for those mistakes. And the cost is borne um, largely by us and our partners and in the resources that we allocate. So in that case, we've determined the advantages of the tools are well worth it. But the counter example that we often think of is in some of the models that Enrique alluded to in criminal justice settings. So if you think about uh, so-called predictive policing or some of these models trying to, trying to make recommendations um, about um, whether someone should be released pretrial or trying to predict the outcome uh, of, of a, a judicial action, when those models make mistakes, they send police into communities that may already be over-policed they degrade that community trust in that relationship. Um, or in the case of uh, making recommendations about pretrial uh, restrictions, they may put someone in jail uh, who, who should not be and who should be released. And those costs are significant and they are borne by already marginalized or disadvantaged populations who often lack the 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 power the the opportunity to push back on those decisions and those recommendations that are being made by those models and so in those examples 
we consider those costs to be uh, not worth it. We consider those costs to be higher than the advantage gained from any of those model applications. But that's also one of the infrastructures that we try and think about is if we were going to use these tools in those settings, are there ways that we can incentivize that setting so that perhaps the, the designer of the model or the vendor of the tool pays that cost and, and therefore it gets fed back into the system in a different way? Thank you. Yes, this is this is the question that I want to come to. This this assessment rubric that you've developed and that you're applying, thinking about how it can be used more broadly beyond organizations such as your own, which is already um, committed to human rights, not just in service, but in in the development and, and, and applications of its own tools and methods. So Enrique, if AI is going to be more widely used as a tool for human rights research and, and, and documentation and investigation. And, and if it's going to be used more widely generally, which it most certainly is, what is the supportive infrastructure needed to effectively achieve that? Thank you. Um, it's quite likely inevitable that artificial intelligence or anything that is under that umbrella will uh, be uh, growingly used in the context of human rights practice. That is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, in many cases, uh, we have uh, organizations uh, or human rights practitioners will be forced to adopt technology as a way to uh, avoid obsolescence. So even when inevitable, I think that there should be uh, something in the back of our head, thinking that it may not be necessary, but just a forced decision. Uh, that said, in thinking of the infrastructure that uh, we may need for that uh, adoption uh, to be uh, not only efficient, but also meaningful, uh, I, I think that the easier bit is already in the technical infrastructure. Uh, many of the things that we are allowed to do today uh, are possible because companies have been offering uh, or have been lowering the barrier for uh, us to access uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, and the like. So um, in that sense, uh, technical infrastructure is, uh, is perhaps what is the most available. What I think uh, there is a lack of is perhaps on issues that are a bit softer. Uh, um, uh, issues around literacy, infrastructure that, in a way, uh, will allow for uh, judges, for lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. for researchers to understand the nuances around uh, um, artificial intelligence. In the same way, I think that we are lacking of a governance infrastructure. You know, what is that uh, some of these uh, technologies uh, are doing will remain obscure uh, for a long time uh, without, without having a, an infrastructure for explainability. In, in that sense. And I think that that's, those softer needs are, are the ones that are the most challenging and in some ways uh, the most uh, necessary. Um, yeah. So I, I want to delve into that a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, Megan, but then Enrique, I, you may have something else that you'd like to add as well. On these, on these softer issues beyond the technical capacity um, of, of the tools of AI now and as they're being developed, are there existing models um, that you've seen applied in practice or, or perhaps that you're seeing promoted that should be applied for effectively embedding human rights and ethics into the AI development process? I wish I had a better answer to that question. I mean, I think at, I think at a um, long-term view perspective, there's a lot more action within the academic community to try and embed human rights and ethics from the beginning in a lot of these education programs. And I think there are also a lot of existing academic venues, conferences like the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency conferences um, that are really addressing some of these questions. But those we're not going to reap the benefits of the education and the training that those individuals are getting um, for years, uh, which is fine, that's one angle, um, but there are um, there are implementations of these models affecting people's lives right now every day. And so many of those are being implemented within large private tech companies. And I worry that in fact, what we're witnessing right now is a lot of ethics washing um, and a lot of, of surface value talking about ethics without perhaps doing the harder work of truly embedding and incentivizing application of a human rights and ethics lens. And because so much of this is happening within private industry, I honestly don't 
have a good answer or, or an idea for what that model might look like. I mean, regulation is one one tool in the toolkit that has obviously had very mixed results in in a variety of other settings. Um, and and to go back to the academic example, I think one thing that academics have a tendency to reach for is some sort of a review board. And I think institutional review boards have had fairly mixed results as well too. So unfortunately, I, I don't have sort of strong positive use cases. Um, and I do also just want to vigorously agree with Enrique's point about the need for a lot of this, this, this the other pieces around the technology and the communication and the education piece. Um, that, that has very much been our experience as well in working with a lot of our partners where they say really the need that they have is to to have better tools and better um, better assistance in helping people understand the impacts that these are having and the ways that they're getting used out in the real world. Thank you. So, Enrique, I'll, I'll turn this, the question to you as well. And you identified as sort of these these soft needs of of literacy and governance. Um, are, are there existing models that you think should be expanded upon? Or are there promising areas um, of, of potential um, uh, growth or, or um, development in these areas that you think we should be promoting and really applying more in practice so that we are, we are infusing human rights into development and deployment from the ground up? At the governance level, I think that there is a significant gap and there's so far not a, not great commitments. I think there are good answers. There are good ideas out there. There's, a, there's for example, a, issues where we can learn from the way the pharmaceutical industry is regulated or the way the, 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 the food and uh, alum, uh, uh, food industry is regulated in terms of like uh, letting you know what is inside the box, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of sugar that is inside that, the impact that, you know, certain uh, ingredients may have in certain populations. That is something that could be extrapolated, that could be brought to some of this. Like it would be interesting, and again, uh, as an example, to know, you know, how good, how bad this could be for you if you are a Latino immigrant to the US, right? This piece of technology could have this effect on you. Um, now that said, in, in artificial intelligence, in the developing technology, in, in reality, like one of the big challenges is that it's a, it's a, it's a rapidly developing space. And perhaps some of the, uh, some of the, uh, exercises of transparency in some companies are a good beginning. I mean, again, I think that, and I agree with Megan, that these are just mostly uh, some ethic washing exercises, but you know, there may be some crevices where some of those things can be uh, deepened or expanded. Uh, I do think that there is a, a, an opportunity around uh, that is perhaps the result of the lack of uh, knowledge around the specificity uh, of the underpinnings of some of these technical developments uh, that may allow to uh, for us to uh, promote or or propose uh, forward-looking bits of technology. Uh, my sense is that if we were to focus on explainability per se as a building block of many other great things, we could convince uh, some of these actors to set the first step. You know, just in, in knowing what something is doing, we could then find other ways for uh, accountability, ethics, and others. Great, thank you. So a question for both of you, pivoting now back to, to the positive applications uh, of AI for human rights. What do you both see as the new frontier in that area? What questions might be able to be answered that couldn't previously? Or, or what hurdles might we be able to overcome in human rights investigations with the use of AI tools? Um, Megan. Um, well, I'll start with uh, just some of the specific applications that my organization focuses on. And what we've really seen in the last year or so has been just a tremendous increase in what we can consider data, what we can, can turn into quantifiable, analyzable data, and how we can fill in gaps uh, in, in existing data. So not only leveraging AI for things like, like form extraction and, and getting information out of unfriendly formats, but also leveraging those same kind of classification models to try to predict uh, missing values. And it's been really interesting for me with a background in, st in statistics because in some sense, a lot of these 
a lot of these problems have been around for a very long time and it's a little bit easy to think of them as solved problems to think well there's been missing data imputation or there's been particular methods to adjust for this kind of missing data or this kind of non-response error and and it's true that as is so often the case in science these are problems that we've been working on for quite some time but i really feel like in the last year in our specific use cases the kind of structured data that we have and, and unstructured data we've really turned a corner in, in how much of it we're able to turn into analysis ready data sets and get at a lot of questions that we've really been hesitant to use quant, uh, quantitative analysis for, that we've really encouraged more qualitative work. And I think that mixed methods approach is always gonna be valuable, um, but there are a lot of questions around um, things like cause of death and perpetrator groups that that have, are really, really hard to document in a lot of settings. And I think we now have better tools to extract and make use of that limited amount of information that we have on some of those topics. Great, thank you. Enrique. Uh, that's great. Um, I, uh, so I think that there's several places where I can get excited about the future of uh, artificial intelligence or whatever is under the umbrella uh, in the context of human rights practice. Uh, first, uh, small things, things that may look as interesting as others, but uh, I do think that there is the possibility for great efficiency in a, uh, for the creation of efficiency in small tasks that right now are getting on the way of uh, organizations uh, trying to manage large volume of data. You know, like the automatic creation of a uh, mosaic images that assist or aid in the location of a particular incident you know, uh, is something that I can imagine uh, becoming a, a good example of the application of AI. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, applying AI to small tasks uh, that can create efficiency in places that are already strained by, by resources. Uh, another space where my colleagues are working uh, in, uh, is around uh, event reconstruction. What can we do uh, to gather uh, uh, mixed formats of information and create a, a much better view of something that has happened? Uh, colleagues, at, my colleagues at CMU as well as in C2 have played with this in uh, the recreation of events in the Ukraine, for example, and that has allowed for a judge to better understand what may have happened. Um, another thing that I, I am interested or curious, and I think that could be something quite interesting over time, is what is that we do as with these new tools, and what is that we can do with these new tools to better understand our past, you know, our short and long term past? How is that we can review issues? Or, uh, related to human rights abuse, uh, and what is it we can learn once that we use these tools for that? Um, and finally, perhaps, is uh, what can come as the result of uh, the democratization of access to technologies. A lot of the things that we see today as advancements are the result of the opening, of the open sourcing of uh, some simple technologies or relatively simple technologies in in contrast to what uh, you know, some heavy corporations or large intelligence apparatus have. But uh, I'm very curious. I think that the next frontier, in a sense, is going to be ones that uh, uh, populations in what some of us may still call the global south, you know, what is going to happen once that the others start to take care of their problems? What is when the solutions start to come from the people that do perceive and have the problems? Uh, you know, with a different level of agency and interest. And I think that that particular space is going to be incredibly interesting. Great, thank you both so much. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, I wanna give you each an opportunity to make any kind of closing remarks that, that you would like. You've got a couple of minutes. Um, Megan, first you. Thanks. Um, I think I, I mostly just want to sort of reiterate and, and continue to, to vigorously agree with Enrique. Um, I mean, these these tools we so often hear in this context that that technology is neutral or, or things like that and at its barest sense i suppose that's true but but then it's used by people and it's used in many cases on people and so i think that the more we can ask you know either the question our team asks what's what's the cost of getting it wrong um the, the better. And I think the more we can really think about, uh, as we've been discussing these, the soft pieces around the technology, how are we explaining it to people? Um, how are we educating folks about the way it's getting used? And that may be the folks that decisions are being made for or about. Uh, that may be the folks who are using it as a tool. That may be judges and lawyers. Um, and so I think having this more expansive view 
not just of the, the model itself and the math and the science involved, but all of these surrounding contextual pieces, uh, I think is really going to be crucial as we start to use it more and more in these human rights applications. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. So perhaps one thing that I, I have learned and I would like to share with others is the value of com uh, connecting communities of practice. It, perhaps the, the biggest value I have seen uh, in terms of the application of artificial intelligence uh, to human rights uh, research uh, has come as the result of connecting practitioners, often in academia, but, uh, and, and less often in corporations, with practitioners on uh, the human rights space. And that connection that is it, it, it's away from the the big discourse around the impact of artificial intelligence, the fear of singularity and the like, has uh, has become incredibly valuable. That short-term uh, application-oriented has been uh, fantastic. Um, yeah. Thank you, Enrique. I think we have time for for maybe a question or two before we close, and we have a we have a specific question for you, Megan, based on the work you described in Mexico. Um, and it's it's asking how much ground truth do you have to do to validate the model you use in Mexico? Uh, and is there a lot of it? Uh, what is the spatial granularity of the model's output? Which is a very specific question and, and you may not have that answer right at hand, but but I think you understand the the, the intention of the question. Yeah, it's it's a great question because in in all of our applications, ground truth is is so hard to come by. If it exists at all, uh, it's very expensive. And so, in the particular case of this work in Mexico, our partners have relied on two primary data sources: um, media sources that have documented the discovery of these hidden graves and uh, judicial uh, legal findings from the investigations where these graves have been found. And so those are the two sources of ground truth for where graves have been found. And then of course the hardest part is identifying where graves have not been found because the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and that's where we rely so heavily on our partners who really do have a very deep contextual knowledge of the setting and have been able to say to us with, with some confidence, no, in, in these years and these locations, we really think it's, it's not just that no graves have been found, we think it's true that no graves exist. Um, and so that's really uh, sort of the structure of, of our, our data is areas that are labeled as yes, the graves have been found, no, they don't exist, and we don't know, and that's of course what the model's predicting. Uh, and then standard machine learning practice, we hold some data out to then test our model, uh, we found that it is pretty accurate at, at identifying the, the status of, of known geographic locations. Um, I actually do have the answer to the, the spatial granularity question, which is right now, it's at the municipio level, which is, is quite a large geographic region. Um, it's essentially like a state. Um, and that is one of the things that we're working on is if we can't necessarily define a smaller geographic region, can we add more to the model that tells us more about attributes of an area within a municipio? So is it near water or is it near a road? Um, we're starting to describe more geographic attributes. Um, but right now the granularity is uh, rather large. And again, that comes from the data that we have access to is, is at that level as well. Great, thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid we do need to wrap up uh, our discussion today. And I, I really want to thank Dr. Megan Price and Enrique Pirases for joining us for our conversation on Human Rights Day about AI and human rights. And I also want to thank Hitachi for sponsoring the event, uh, which is the final in our series for 2020 on responsible AI, where we started the series looking at uh, environmental monitoring and sustainability as it relates to AI. Then we moved to AI, triage and the COVID-19 pandemic. And today we've been focused on AI and human rights. Uh, we have archived all of the conversations in this series and last year's on our website. I encourage you to go to those if you hadn't, haven't had a chance to either listen in at the time or to read the uh, resources associated with each event. So thank you all very much. I wish you all a safe and healthy 2020 and I hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.